Now, for this webinar, let me give you a few uh, bit of information to demonstrate how serious the subject matter is. For certain, we do not know the number of fishers affected by modern slavery, but the International Labor Organization estimates that 24 million people around the world, let that number sink, 24 million people around the world are in forced level. 16 million of those are in the private economy. And for those whose type of work was known, the agriculture and fishing industry made up 11%. And that is just for those who are classified as being in modern slavery. Exploitation of fishermen occurs on a spectrum you know, it goes, it you know, has a trajectory or cause on a spectrum. At the extreme of that spectrum is forced labor and modern slavery. So in between there are ramifications. But there is often a fine line between what is classed as exploitation and what is defined as modern slavery, very thin line which you will hear more about later. In this webinar also, you will hear about the ways in which fishermen are exploited and manipulated, different types of modern slavery and exploitation, how this is being tackled by government agencies, current research, and more importantly, how Stella Maris supports those involved. Now, enough of, enough of the preamble. It's now time for us to delve into the subject matter with our first speaker. Our first speaker this evening is Dr. Jess Sparks. Jess is a firm and trusted friend of Stella Maris, with whom we are currently working on a global survey of fishers. She is the associate director of the University of Nottingham Rights Lab Ecosystems and Environment Program. Her research focuses on the interconnections between environmental and climatic change and a spectrum of working conditions ranging from decent work to forced labor and modern slavery, including the relationship between fish stock declines, illegal fishing, and labor abuses aboard fishing vessels. She has worked in the labor and human rights fields for over 15 years. First, as a social worker, and now as a researcher. So you can see that Jess covers both sides as a social worker interacting with the fishers, now as a researcher looking deeper into the subject matter. Jess, if you're ready, the floor is all yours and we are all ears. Thank you, William, for that very kind introduction. And hopefully I am sharing my screen now. Yes, William, I, you're on my screen. So if you can give me a thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you for that great introduction, which segues so nicely into the beginning of my presentation. So um, I just wanted to call attention at the very beginning here that the artwork on this slide was actually produced um, by a survivor of modern slavery. And so in my presentations, I like to center some of the work produced by survivors themselves that helps on their journey um, post uh, removal from the situations that they have been in. So as we heard uh, just a few moments ago, 
Uh, I'm a researcher and I very much think of modern slavery and decent work as a spectrum. This is also because globally uh, these terms actually mean different things and they may be defined differently in laws. So for example, on the extreme end, our UK based audience is going to be very familiar with the term modern slavery. We have the Modern Slavery Act in the United Kingdom, of course, but in other parts of the world, often human trafficking, um, though defined in the Palermo Protocol, um, it is often used as an umbrella term for situations such as um, that encompass slavery, servitude, and forced labor. Of note, modern slavery, beyond being defined in UK and Australia in national law, it is not actually defined at the international stage, which is why some people will use the term human trafficking instead, or forced labor, which is much more clearly defined in the ILO convention. So that's the extreme end of the spectrum. And for example, how this manifests in fishing, which I believe the chaplains will talk more about, um, for example, is debt bondage. So we know that fishers incur extreme and exploitive debt from recruiters. Sometimes this can also be debt to the vessel owners and that no matter how much they continue to work, they're not actually able to pay off that debt. It just keeps accruing and means that even if they're unhappy in their work environment, their movement is restricted. They may not be able to leave the situation because they've accrued so much debt. Other times they may be paying off the debt, but that the fees and the debt that they have reduces their salary or their wages well below standards or well below what is necessary to live. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have labor exploitation, which is much less severe, and it may or may not be in violation of labor laws and regulations. For example, something that we often see is wage disparities. So you may have a sector in a country and the domestic fishers may actually make more per hour than the migrant fishers. This is often exploitive, especially when coupled with debt that they may have recruiters that um, assisted them in obtaining the work. But it's also not often, often it is not illegal for a migrant fisher to be paid less than a domestic fisher. Recently in the United Kingdom, there now is a national minimum wage law, which would make this in violation in the UK. But in many countries, this is an exploitive practice that doesn't reach that threshold of violating law. And of course, what's not pictured on this at the far left end of the spectrum would be decent work. And so I think often in practice, um, decent work is defined in ILO Convention 188, which is work in fishing. And so it does set norms and regulations around what decent work should look like. It is very clearly articulated. But often in practice, I think there is a tendency to define decent work by the absence of its antithesis those extreme forms. And so we really want to work in the sector towards making sure that decent work, when we identify something as decent work, it really is decent work and not just the absence of something really bad and extreme. And when we just focus on the absence of the really bad and extreme, what we often miss is all that stuff in the middle, that lower level, quote unquote, exploitation that again may not constitute violations of laws and or may not reach the threshold of modern slavery that, as William told us, is extremely important to consider because there's a very thin line. So where does labor exploitation and modern slavery and fishing occur? Uh, we got a nice overview of the different geographies. I've been researching this issue for approximately eight years now, and this is actually, um, this is often the assumption. People think that labor exploitation modern slavery is exclusive to Southeast Asia. We know that there's been Guardian reports in the UK, um, AP reports out of the United States that have focused on Thailand. We know about workers from Indonesia. And yes, there are absolutely labor abuses and modern slavery in Southeast Asia. But it's certainly not the only place in the world where we see these issues. And in the eight years, so this is our assumption, in the eight years that I've been researching this issue, 
And this is an aggregation of all of the countries that have been impl implicated in interviews that I've conducted with fishers all over the world. So I should point out that the countries in red, um, fishers were either fishing um, for that country's flag, so the vessel was flagged to that country, and or fishing in the um, national waters around that country, what we call the exclusive economic zone. So within 200 miles of that country's coast. Um, so you can see this is a lot of countries that have been implicated. And I should caution that any country in gray is not absolved of having issues um, in their fisheries. It's just that um, in the research that I've done, we haven't obtained data from those countries. For example, uh, years ago when I first started this research, I was told that the Scandinavian countries had no labor issues in their fisheries, they were an impeccable model, and actually when I started doing my research uh, there, people started detailing what was pretty ex ex exploited practices. It may not have reached that threshold of modern slavery or forced labor, but they were definitely exploitive. And uh, just last year, there was actually a case um, of human trafficking of two Ghanaian fishers um, in the Danish fisheries. And so I always caution that just because we don't have evidence or data from a country yet doesn't mean that it's absolved and that its fisheries are perfect. So what is the relationship between overfishing and labor exploitation? And this immediate relationship is a little bit of an oversimplification, but what we see is that overfishing um, and also maybe illegal fishing, um, as that increases, it puts a lot of pressure on stocks. And as stocks decrease, um, vessels actually have to fish harder um, in order to maintain their yields. So that may mean fishing further out from shore, staying out at sea longer, um, fishing more hours, deeper, et cetera. That can be in lots of different ways. And when that effort increases, because there are what we call very few input costs, um, fuel and labor make up a majority of the cost on a fishing vessel that if they increase their effort, um, that their profit margins are going to start to be squeezed a little bit. And so how does something respond to that squeeze on the profit margins? It may actually increase the demand for cheap labor. Often in the fishery sector, um, cheap labor is associated with using migrant fishers um, rather than relying on a domestic workforce. And um, as the migrant workforce increases and an operator may start Start making profits off of that. It's that tricky relationship between profit and exploitive practices that starts to approach potentially um, states of forced labor and modern slavery. But I say this is an oversimplification because it's embedded in a big gray circle. And that big gray circle basically includes a whole lot of other factors, including systemic structural factors. For example, just because someone's profits are squeezed, um, why would they necessarily start using migrant laborers and start paying them less or exploiting them in ways that could constitute forced labor? And the reality is, is that often this becomes an economic justification to operators um, because of structural forms of discrimination like racism, xenophobia, et cetera. Um, I've had multiple vessel owners tell me throughout research um, that, for example, Indonesians are the cheapest workforce that you can get. And or this may be a lot of money for this migrant worker to make in their country. And so again, that's when you start to see that spectrum of labor exploitation, where it's not necessarily in violation of a law, um, but is not decent work for those workers. And most importantly, and why it's centered is that there are power imbalances. And so we know that most of the power in seafood supply chains is concentrated in the companies, the retailers, and that workers, there's a real power imbalance that inhibits workers from coming forward, um, from reporting things, um, and from using agency to um, alter those power imbalances in the seafood supply chains. 
Oh, and so um, a couple other things that I want to that I think is also really important to highlight is the immigration and migration laws. So sometimes fishers cannot physically get off a vessel because they do not have the authority uh, to, to be present in a country. And I think that's uh, where the work of Stella Maris is really unparalleled in terms of going to the fishers and trying to help fishers that otherwise may not be able to access support and help in a particular country. So as was mentioned, um, my current research, I'm working on a large scale global survey with Fishers in collaboration with Stella Maris. And I always like to preface to say that Stella Maris has been working on this on these issues and in this space uh, a lot longer than I have. And most of everything that I've learned about the working conditions uh, that Fishers experience originated in conversations with the chaplains and volunteers of Stella Maris. So they really do have um, parallel insight. And so I'm really excited to be working with them. So we have chaplains and volunteers uh, administering surveys in countries all over the world. And that's because we really want to center the Fisher's experience. So as there's a need for increased research and evidence to inform policy and practice, it's of course really, really difficult to, re to access Fisher's um, because they're at sea, um, especially if you're being exploited or in conditions of forced labor and modern slavery operating outside the law, it's just very, very difficult to access these fissures. And so as a result, there's a shift in a need to engage with alternative data sources, but it cannot be at the expense of ignoring those fissures experience, which is why I'm really excited to be doing this research with Stella Maris. And so the purpose, why are we doing a survey all over the world? It's to help us understand global patterns. We know that uh, there's often blind spots. Uh, talking to Father Tamar, for example, in Montevideo, um, talking to the chaplains and the Seychelles and Mauritius, for example, often sites that we don't talk a lot about when we're talking about modern slavery and forced labor and fishing. Um, also to test assumptions. There's a lot of assumptions that these problems only happen on the high seas, um, that they only happen on really large industrial vessels. And again, just from a conversation that I was having with the Stella Maris um, folks in Mauritius a couple weeks ago, I learned about all the exploitive practices that happen to migrant fishers in the small scale sector. And so we really want to test these assumptions that exist to see if they're true or if they're essentially creating blind spots. Um, because if they're creating blind spots, we really need to focus on those to make sure that our policies and practices aren't just further perpetuating those blind spots. And we want to highlight those exploitive practices that do not meet the threshold of modern slavery. So again, getting a really good picture of what decent work um, is in the fishing sector. And I already talked about centering the fishers' uh, voices. So we're looking at, we just started data collection a couple weeks ago, and we'll be doing our data collection until the end of March. And so really looking forward to sharing the findings of our research with the entire Stellar Mars community uh, when we're done with that. And so again, I like to emphasize that it's really the style of Mars chaplains and volunteers that have a lot of the expertise. And as the researcher, I sort of see myself here as um, helping to systemize and organize all that knowledge um, and all that experience that they have with Fishers firsthand. So um, thank you very much for allowing me to talk a little bit about our collaboration today. And I look forward to any questions at the conclusion of the panelists, um, but also um, just wanted to share my email in case anybody wants to reach out with any other questions that we can't cover today. So thank you very much. Amazing. Uh, that's a simple uh, comment on your presentation. Uh, straight to the point and direct. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jess. Uh, it, it shows that you're at home uh, with this subject matter. Just by way of uh, recap, I, uh, of course, uh, I'm not competent to, to repeat all the things you've, you've said as a researcher. Uh, the details are there for all of us to see, but just to uh, bring all of us back to, to reality as it were, you started off with the definition of uh, modern slavery, uh, what it is, uh, it's a continuum. But the more I tried to understand what it is, the more confused I got. 
because uh, you can't really put a finger on it because of the very complex nature of it being in a spectrum and each has its own ramifications. You also did talk about where this problem occur, uh, predominantly Southeast Asia, but from what you've just explained from the map, it does appear it is global, it's everywhere, uh, because for the great part of the map, you have not received data. So as time goes on, possibly you will get some more information. So from my own estimation, deduction, uh, it is global. You also try to establish a relationship between overfishing and labor exploitation and all the nuances that go with it. And uh, I can see central to that is the power play of the, the because as they say, he that pays the piper dictates the tune. And uh, the couple of other issues you raised and more importantly, the research you are currently doing uh, with uh, Stella Maris. I am sure uh, there'll be a number of questions uh, for you to provide answers to uh, when we round up with all the speakers. Just for me to say, thank you so much. Uh, I'm better informed now on the subject matter. So we have to move on now to our second speaker. Uh, you are now going to hear from Father Jans Gunther, uh, Stella Maris chaplain in Taiwan, who regularly supports exploited fishermen. And because, as I said earlier, it's way past into the morning, uh, it wasn't possible for uh, Father Jans to be physically uh, present, even if it's virtual anyway, uh, to, to present in person. So uh, we have a pre-recorded session, uh, which we'll, we'll play, but please do uh, get your question out and um, get ready to, uh, you know, pose them to Father Jans for appropriate response. So may I uh, request that Father Jans uh, presentation uh, is played right away. Hi everyone, I am Father Yance. I am currently working in Stella Maris Kaohsiung, Taiwan. It is our privilege to be invited to this uh, webinar by Stella Maris UK. It is a great opportunity also to share our work with fishers in Taiwan. Taiwan is considered as the second country with the largest number of long-distance fishing vessels. They employ around 30,000 foreign fishers and most of them are coming from Southeast Asia. I have been working in this sector for around three years already. And what are the common issues that uh, we have encountered in this fishing industry? First of all, this fishing industry is focusing more on profit, not on the person. Why I said so? Because if you try to look at the annual income from this industry compared to the salary of the fishers, you can really see a really wide difference. Every year, the, the, the annual income is 1.9 billion. The salary of the fisher, the standard salary is only 450 US dollar a month. So if you have 30,000 fishers times 450 US dollar times 12 months, the total will be around 162 million uh, US dollar. So it is not even 10% of the total income from this fishing industry is given uh, for the fishers. Another problem that I encounter in this year so working with fishers in the ports of Taiwan is that the low education of the fishers. Most of them are elementary and high school graduates. 
they don't have enough knowledge about working abroad they don't have enough knowledge about the rules and regulations in their employment and that's the reason why many of them are vulnerable to be abused and manipulated since january this year we have processed and assisted 91 cases of officers we assisted their complaints and claims these fishes are working in 21 fishing vessels. Recently, for example, this month, I processed the cases of uh, 29 Filipinos. Uh, right now, they are in China. So they, they have been there already for more than uh, the period of their contract. They have been waiting to return home because they don't want to work uh, anymore in that uh, fishing vessel because they say that, Father, we have lack of food inside the, the ship. We really suffer, we want to go home. So, um, and then I try to check the fishing vessel. That fishing vessel is not Taiwan flag fishing vessel. And then they told me, Father, uh, our, our agency is in Taiwan. So I make the complaint to fishery agency. And after that, they contacted this uh, mining agency and pressure them to, uh, to take care of the fishers who are already stranded in China. But uh, the Taiwan Fishery Agency also told me, Father, certainly we don't have the authority to uh, command uh, those who are the employers of that ship because uh, they are the, the, the fishing vessel is not Taiwan flag fishing vessel. So all we can do is just to pressure the mining agency. I said, you just do whatever you can to save these pieces because they are stranded. They send me the videos. They don't have any uh, any more uh, food. They don't have enough food in the ship. So they are really afraid. They are really suffering there. They want to go home. Besides contacting the Taiwanese uh, authorities, I also contacted the Philippine uh, representatives here. I told them that we have these 29 Filipinos stranded in China. Please do something. Try to contact your government in the Philippines so that they can do this kind of diplomatic approach with China to help our fishers. Otherwise, they will die uh, starving there in the, at sea. So right now, those guys are keep uh, are still in contact with me because they are now in quarantine in China. There is so much fear among the fishers to report cases because they are afraid of losing their job. The fishers prefer to resist the abuses instead of reporting the cases. Only when we assure them that they will not lose the job, then they have the courage to make complaints and claims. Taiwan Fisheries Agency has been great in helping uh, solving these problems. The mining agencies in the country would ask the fishers to withdraw the complaints after solving the disputes because they don't want to have bad records in the government list. Financially, we have recovered more than 100,000 US dollars out of these complaints. Since 2017, Taiwan has enacted the regulations on the authorization and management of overseas employment of foreign crew members. In these regulations, it states clearly that the mining agencies has to explain clearly the working contract and give one copy for the fisher. And it has to be written in both languages, in Chinese and in the language of the fisher. In reality, some fishers don't hold the working contract and some sign the contract shortly before the departure. In the signing of the contract, for example, they, they will not explain uh, clearly the contract. And sometimes uh, many of them, they will uh, deduct the salary because they said that uh, it will be for contract insurance or for other costs there is not written in the working contract. This, since they don't have enough knowledge on the regulations, they do not know that there is no such kind of uh, working contract insurance. That's why these guys just follow. That's why you will see some fishers 
they uh, did that uh, they don't receive salary for five six seven months until nine months as they work uh, in the taiwan fishing vessels and now how is telamaris council respond to the issues of the fishes first and foremost we conduct regular visits in the port center in the fishing vessels we go there to listen to the fishes to see their living condition, and also to understand what kind of help we can offer them. Also, it is also a moment in our sea visits to experience that kind of fraternity, because several times they invite us to eat with them, and also we bring with us some things like clothes, uh, some food, some rosaries to be given for the fishers. Secondly, we also have offer education and formation, not only for visas, but also for the local people and the university students. We try to educate the visas on knowing your rights and obligations. We teach them the regulations in the fishing industry and also the labor laws. We also organize activities on wellness and mental health for visas we organize outings, visit different places in Taiwan to refresh their minds. We also organize sports for them. Uh, we often play badminton, soccer, and uh, basketball together. And we also have this kind of uh, recreational nights in Stella Maris. They come here to have barbecue, to uh, sing karaoke, playing cards, and we really hope that as they bring all these difficult stories, difficult experiences from the sea, and they tell us about those stories, we hope that from this port and from Stella Maris, they can bring good memories as they journey again in the far distant seas. We are really active in advocacy for fishers in Taiwan. We have regular meetings with uh, Taiwan Fisheries Agency where we can really share to them the living condition of the fishers and the issues that they encounter in their employment. And we hope that the government can really uh, offer better policies for them and better protection for their rights. Uh, not only with Taiwan government, we also communicate with the sending countries like uh, Indonesian Economic and Trade Office of Taipei, where we can really tell them some issues of the fishers uh, and also uh, try to invite them also to make better policies for fishers. Also with the Manila Economic and Cultural Office, we have regular meetings with them and try to discuss the issue. I believe that all people, all institutions are, have, have to be part of the solutions. And by having these communications with government institutions and also different NGOs who are caring for visas, I guess we can come up with better solutions for visas. And finally, I thank again Stella Maris UK for uh, this invitation. And I hope that more people can help our ministry because uh, we really need your support to do this ministry with the fishers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Father Jans. Good job. Um, let me make a confession, uh, distinguished uh, participants and panelists. You know, I had initially introduced uh, Father Young that it's going to be a recorded delivery. But when he started, I frankly thought he was there in person. But it was so clear, so clear. And um, I was almost thinking that did he suddenly change his mind and presented in person. So it was quite clear that thanks to technology. Uh, many thanks to Father Young and for the advocacy work you are doing. Uh, you are in every every part of the lives of this very critical uh, supply chain uh, in, in the industry. Um, we I just want to say 
you from the work you're doing, you are putting humanity into this very challenging uh, aspect of uh, fishing. And your communication with uh, various key players and government agencies are key to resolving this issue. Uh, your expose on the contracts and the ramifications, and more so the lack of understanding of the features of the content of the contract they, saw, they, they signed is quite critical. So uh, I would say, please um, uh, keep it up and continue the good work and it's being recognized. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I'm sure questions will follow uh, subsequently. And that's it for our second speaker. For our third speaker, uh, of course, you know, we are making progress, um, even if it's slowly, but we're making progress. But before then, let me just uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, participants from all parts of the world. New Zealand, wherever, Rome, just name it. Uh, it's so much interest in this very important subject matter. And thank you all for, for uh, you know, uh, putting up appearance. And of course, uh, for the Bruno Cesero uh, is also amongst us. So, um, uh, thank you so much. Now, our third speaker is Mark, Mark Cam. Mark is a lead investigator for the UK's Maritime and Coast Agency. The Maritime and Coast Agency is responsible for implementing uh, British and international maritime law, and it's an agency Stella Maris often works with when we are concerned about Fisher's working conditions. And this has been uh, part of our very, very uh, major concern and Stella Maritz has been there all through the way. Uh, and kudos to Stella Maritz for this sterling work. And it's now my privilege to uh, invite uh, my camp to please uh, speak on his work on the subject matter. Mark, over to you. Mark, you are muted. We can unmute. You are still muted. I'm trying to see if I can unmute it from here. I can't. Is that better yep. now? Yep. Okay. You're okay. on now. Okay. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, um, I spent 30 years in the Metro Police, and after that, two years in the National Crime Agency. And at that point, obviously, in the National Crime Agency, I did deal with modern slavery. Um, and so when I think of modern slavery, I think of it in the very uh, sort of tight legal terms, particularly Section 1 of our Bond Slavery Act. Um, I've subsequently moved to the uh, Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background of what we do. But what I have to make it, and I've made it very clear um, to Stella Maris, we do not have any powers to investigate or deal with modern slavery in the strict terms that we would look at it legally. But I will be in a position to speak about um, some of the aspects of it. OK, uh, and I'm going to do a bit of a, um, a government briefing thing. Sarah, could you give me the next slide, please? Uh, OK, so our primary uh, and we're a relatively small agency, particularly the, uh, the team I work for, is to prevent loss of life at sea. We produce legislation and part of that legislation has been around Fisher's working conditions. And certification is another thing that applies in many cases where um, there is poor working conditions and exploitation. Uh, Sarah, can you do the next one, please? Just as bullet points we're responsible for the safety of everybody in a vessel in UK waters. And by that, we mean up to 12 miles offshore. So that could be foreign flag vessels coming into UK waters within 12 miles. The safety of all seafarers on UK, UK flag vessels. Now that can be wherever they are in the world, but primarily it is within the ones we deal are within the vicinity of the UK. 
making sure the equipment is fit for purpose. And that can include the fisher's um, own welfare uh, equipment. And it might be washing machines on the boat. It could be all manner of things, but there's a broad um, remit for our survey inspection to look at that. And as I said, making sure that they have the correct documentation. I'm going to come on to that in a moment, particularly when it comes to the fishermen's working agreements. Uh, Sarah, could you give me the next one, please? So we are split up in several different teams within the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. My team uh, where I work for is a regulatory compliance investigations team. We are small. There's 10 of us that covers the whole of the UK. And uh, our primary role is to deal with health and safety legislation, particularly when we have fatalities on fishing boats. So we, uh, we have a, a grading system for our investigations, which basically looks that we will only take on investigations which are significant breaches of maritime legislation. And a lot of the... Um, for one a better way, the, the ILO breach, which I'll talk about, which is around the welfare of fishers, does not often come to the level of a significant breach and will be dealt with by survey and inspection. Could you give me the next slide, please, Sarah? Now, survey inspection, my colleagues in survey inspection are the people that go out and inspect and survey the fishing vessels and all the other vessels, liners, uh, passenger ferries. And they are the ones that see firsthand initially the conditions that are on these ferries, sorry, on these uh, fishing boats. There is a limited number of them. There's some 4,000 fishing vessels in the UK. And then there are a, a vast number of other commercial vessels that we are responsible for. Could you give me the next slide, please, sir? And our powers primarily come under the Merchant Shipping Act of 1995. And I have to stress again that we are not first responders and have no powers under the Modern Slavery Act. That is reserved for the police. The National Crime Agency and certain parts of the Home Office and Border Force. We can only refer instances of modern slavery to these agencies. Can you give me the next slide, please, Sarah? How do we become aware of modern slavery allegations, particularly with reference to uh, fishing vessels? The main way is when we get reports from police forces who have allegations made to them, and because it involves a vessel and it's very much outside their comfort zone, uh, we will get their ask for give them advice and assistance, often turning up to assist with the uh, interviews of the victims, interviews of the suspects, um, and evidence gathering on board the vessels. There will be some referrals potentially from our survey and inspection if they see something that they believe is so bad it might amount to modern slavery. We have on occasions allegations from third parties ringing up the regulatory compliance investigations team to make allegations and potentially a result of our own investigations into fishing fleets we might identify something that amounts to modern slavery. Could you, uh, next slide, please, sir. So we effectively, uh, the best way I, I would explain is we have powers relating to what good should look like. And good is really now defined in many ways by ILO, what we call ILO 188. It's an international convention, which is then in, enacted in our case for UK, domestic legislation and other countries uh, will have a similar um, laws to enact it in their own uh, ways. Where it comes in useful for modern slavery investigations is it potentially gives the investigators such as the police 
an idea of what good should look like. What are the minimum standards? Because in many ways, the ILO 188 is a minimum standard. Could you, next slide, please. So what does this, and I'll, I'll use it, the term ILO 188, what, what does it include? Well, the big thing that includes it, so in the UK, is fishermen work agreements. So these are relatively new, about three years old now, and you'll often heard, hear them called as FWAs. And it gives standards of welfare, such as crew accommodation, food, drinking water, catering facilities. And it gives, in those cases, our survey and inspection uh, teams an ability to say what is expected of an owner to, be, to provide for these fishers. Can you give me the next slide, please? It also gives other employment, um, a form of contract of employment with, with the fishing boat owner. And there are model formats for fishermen's work agreements. And the model formats are gonna cover things like place of work, how wages, how much the wages are and how they're paid, the length of employment, healthcare, the fact that repatriation is paid by the owner of the fishing vessel. And this FWA is, is filled out by the owner. And we, when we get on board a fishing vessel, and inspect, we would expect the fisher to have a copy of this FWA and they'll want to be available with the company. And if there is not, we can use powers to detain that vessel, prevent that leaving and going fishing until those FWAs are in place. And, and we frequently do. Can we have the next slide, please, sir? So we have we have powers uh, under the Merchant Shipping Act, the prohibition detention notices, which we can use against the vessel or the owner. And if there is a consistent failure, there is the option for prosecution for these offences under UK legislation. MCA policy is generally to work with owners of vessels to get them to comply. And so we don't automatically go to a prosecution. It is almost always the case that we look to use the threat of not being able to go to sea, for want of a better way of putting it, as a means of getting the owners to start to comply with ILO 188. Next slide, please, Sarah. When it comes to assistance of other law enforcement agencies, since being on the unit, on the team, I've uh, assisted a couple of them. Uh, police investigations. We start perhaps with uh, sometimes tracking the vessel, uh, telling them where the vessel is, where it's been, how long it's been at sea for, how long, therefore, the crew would have been on the vessel. We give them advice on things like crew entitlements, and we would come back to things like these FWAs, the Fisherman Work Agreements. We would accompany them on searches um, and look for documentation and tell them, tell, let the police know what, again, what good looks like in terms of certification of crew and whether or not we're dealing with uh, forged or counterfeit documentation. And we also look at uh, the identification of unsafe conditions and environments which is frequently the case with the um, fishing vessels that are more exploitive of their crews. Sarah, could you give me the next slide, please? So I've asked, I've put this as a question, so um, that, that would come later. Um, what I want to just say, so when this was being put together, I, I did say that I think the, the people who really, from a law enforcement perspective, who, who would be best placed to answer some of the questions would be my the people I've worked with in the police and the National Crime Agency. Um, there are some instances where we've assisted them, a couple of instances. And what we found is when we're dealing with the fishing vessels where there are poor conditions, we find that primarily the uh, European and UK based fishers um, generally are on 
okay conditions. They're often um, share fishermen, so they're getting a share of the catch. What we find is that the fishers from outside uh, Europe are often uh, on salary. They will be recruited through a agent in their home country. And up until very recently, it was frequently the case that uh, the contract given by that agent in the home country was one that was relied on in terms of welfare, payment, time off, uh, length of time work. The, impl the implement <coughs> implement oh dear. implementation of uh, the fishermen's working agreements now is superseded that. And when we go on board, that is what we need to see. The contract that is given by somebody in the home country is meaningless to us. What we need to see is that fishermen's work agreement. And it's getting better now. Um, when it first came in, it was a very hit and miss and they were frequently missing. And now the fishing fleets are aware of the powers of the MCA to detain their vessels and stop them going to sea until these are in place. And there is a, a broad and generally quite good compliance with this. Some of the issues we found uh, with fishers, there is an element of them being trapped on the vessel, not by being prevented from leaving, but more by perhaps immigration policies. Um, people coming in on visas, uh, primarily for those out who were outside Europe until recently, come in on a visa that specifies that they can only work on a particular vessel. And that in gender, I guess, forces them or feels they should stay on board that vessel because to, in order to swap to another vessel, it, it does seem at times the Home Office is very reluctant to allow any modification of that visa in this country. And the fishers view it as they would have to go home, pay another fee to another um, recruitment agent to come back to another vessel in this country, which may be just equally as poor, uh, exploitative of poor conditions. So there's an element of the system trapping them rather than necessarily the owner physically trapping them. But what we haven't seen in these two investigations so far that I've assisted the police with is that it's met the threshold for the CPS to say that a charge should come under uh, Section 1 of the Modern Slavery Act. Many of these fishers have entered the uh, national referral mechanism and actually have been referred on. But the actual meeting of modern slavery as defined by UK law has not, in my experience, in the last couple of years been, uh, been met. Um, in terms of what Stella Maris has done for us, well, the most recent uh, job we did with the police um, when the CPS um, declined to take on as a modern slavery prosecution, we are pursuing it from the, the vessel owner uh, from the point of view of safety and uh, welfare. And Stella Maris gave us a, 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 a fabulous safe space in which to speak to these crew. Um, they, they, when they've come off the fishing vessel, they're invariably tired, scared, and often, uh, often because of the working conditions, not because of the threats, but the working conditions, they're often tired and scared. And that Silamaris, from, from my perspective, gives you that little bit of time for them to settle, know they're in a safe space, and for them to be available to me with a good introduction as well, because in many cases we're dealing with people who aren't particularly trusting or people who are perceived to be from law enforcement. And still a Maris, again, as well as providing that space, provided the introduction and the time for us to speak and, and get best evidence out of these fishers. So I'm very grateful to still a Maris for that. And uh, I think that's about it for me, William. Uh, hopefully I can answer some questions at the end. Oh, you've done excellently well, uh, Mark. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'll just get some water. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I thought I lost you there for a morning. 
Uh, th th thank you so much, uh, Mark. Uh, it's been quite uh, revealing what you do. Uh, granted that you are limited by statute, but uh, even at that, you've been able to to deliver. There's something that uh, resonates uh, with me because part of what you do uh, is taken to uh, the typical prostate control, uh, you know, issues. So quite uh, uh, similar in that sphere. And um, uh, one one comment uh, you made that what good should look like, which is fantastic. So, and for me, I just added a dot, dot, dot. And if it does not look good, then something is wrong. And that's where the red flag comes. Mm. So thank you, that's quite noted. And then your collaboration with the police. And for you, you straddle both sides. Uh, you've been in the police force and now you're, you're on this other side. So that experience, you know, uh, comes to bear positively on the work you do uh, with your colleagues in MCA and, of course, with the collaboration of Stellar Maris. Safety, safety, safety is the catchword. And then your work on the fishermen's uh, work agreement, assistance to other law enforcement, including your tracking services and then crew entitlements. And of course, uh, one interesting part is the immigration bit, why some fishers get stuck on, on the vessel because they can't leave. And um, we, we know what the implications are. I'm also, with the, I was expecting to have maybe part of the impact of COVID as well, you know, uh, in relation to this. But it's been quite exciting. And um, I just want to say thank you so much. As you were delivering, uh, the questions were rolling in. There are quite a number of questions there now, which I, I, I just glanced through, and the very, very interesting questions. Not just to you alone, Mark, but some were specific, you know, for you and a couple uh, to other speakers. Thank you very much. Um, it's been mm -hmm. quite exciting. Now we are moving on. Uh, our fourth and final. Uh, speaker for this evening is uh, Deacon Nick uh, O'Neill. Uh, Nick is a senior area port chaplain for South of England and Wales. He's going to share some stories with us about fishermen that he and his team have recently supported in the UK. So this is going to come from practical point of view, contact, and what the experience has been. And uh, without taking more time, I would uh, yield the floor to Deacon uh, Nick O'Neill. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, William. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, you've already heard, but just to repeat, my name is Deacon Nick O'Neill, and I'm the Senior Area Port Chaplain for the South of England and Wales. So I know that you've heard a lot of information already about some of the different areas and aspects of modern slavery in the fishing industry. And if you were like me some years ago, might have considered that it was something that only happened in faraway lands or at sea thousands of miles away from the UK. But as we saw on Jesse's map and as William alluded to earlier, it's a global problem that sadly involves many countries, including the UK. And it's happening around the coast of our country and possibly almost on your own doorstep. Stella Maris deals with approximately two to four modern slavery cases each year around the whole of the UK. Last year, the team on the South Coast dealt with such a case. So I'd like to take some time to share with you how two of the five fishermen ended up in this predicament and then I'll go on to share some of the details of how these men were treated and how Stella Maris were able to offer various degrees of support. Because this still is an ongoing and active case, I've changed the names of those mentioned. And all that I am about to relay to you now is information gathered from my time with the five men in November last year, and also after chatting to them uh, a, about a week ago to make sure that the information I had was factually correct. So Carl is a Ghanaian national. 
He started his nautical training in 2008 in Ghana. He started at the Regional Maritime University for one year and then had to complete 12 months of working experience at sea. He then returned to the university and continued various years of study to gain all of his appropriate qualifications, along with more working experience at sea to gain the rank of third engineer and officer of the watch. Carl always worked on tankers, bulk carriers, and offshore drilling rigs. All the vessels he worked on were Ghanaian flagged, but obviously traveled to other countries, which he enjoyed immensely. When Carl finished his last contract, he was unsure about how he would get his next job. Somebody told him about an agent they had heard of that helped people get contracts. So Carl took his CV and paperwork to the agent. He was then asked to pay the agent 1,000 pounds to get the contract. And it turned out the agent was also getting paid by the boat owner in Scotland to recruit workers. Carl was told he would be going to work on a Scottish beam trawler, which did not phase him at all, as he was keen to get as much experience as possible on many different types of vessels. He'd also heard that fishing boats paid very well and could provide a possible chance of progressing his career to becoming a chief engineer. Carl also knew that the UK had a wonderful reputation and record for safety within the maritime world. And he was happy that he would be traveling to work on a UK registered boat and that he would be as safe as possible. When Carl arrived, he was set to work almost immediately after setting foot on the boat. He and the other migrant crew were given jobs straight away without any training and without any appropriate protective equipment. What they were given was subpar and some had even passed the expiration date. Carl quickly realized that safety was not important on this boat. They were not shown any procedures for emergency situations. No drills were conducted and they were not shown where any of the equipment was stored. He had great concern that if somebody went overboard, they would not know how to retrieve them. Carl was a qualified maritime engineer, and he was aware of the different codes and conventions and legislation that should be in place for the provision of safety, working conditions and practices. Raj is an Indian national. Raj is a young Indian man that studied and gained a diploma in nautical science. He studied for just over a two year period and also worked as a trainee cadet and then an able seaman on a Lebanese cargo ship. In 2018, he came to Scotland to work on a Scottish prawn boat. But after three months, a border force routine inspection discovered that he had the incorrect visa and he had to return to India. He spent some time not working and worrying about how to get back into work. Again, he was told about an agent that might be able to get him a job on a fishing boat back in Scotland. Raj was happy with this and wanted to earn money to help pay for his sister's wedding and to help his mother financially as his father had passed away some years earlier. Raj paid £2,000 to the agent for his contract. He had to borrow money from friends and family as well as taking money from a loan shark in order to get the contract. The agent, again, was being paid by the boat owner to recruit new members. Raj arrived in the UK and was put to work immediately. He was shocked when he first saw the boat and could not believe that a boat in that condition would be allowed to go to sea. It was clear to him that maintenance was not carried out properly. When they sat in the galley, water would come in through holes in the boat. Cables and wires had snapped and been spliced together with makeshift repairs. Raj knew from his training that the boat was not legal or fit for purpose and was worried for his safety and well-being, as well as for the other crew members. Hopefully you'll now see some images on the screen that highlight and give a flavor of the story I'm about to tell you and the support that these five men received from Stella Maris. The faces of the five fishermen have been pixelated due to the ongoing investigation. In early November, 2020, these two men that I've just told you about 
plus three other migrant crew on board a fishing boat contacted Paul Atkinson, a Stella Maris chaplain based in the north of England. He received a text message from a Sri Lankan fisherman who had met him some years earlier. In the message, he stated that he and the other four migrant crew, the Indian, the three Ghanaians and himself, were all in fear of their lives and desperately wanted to leave the boat. Time was of the essence, as the boat was due to sail at 10 p.m. and it was now 8.30 p.m. Paul contacted me and told me the boat was in Shoreham in West Sussex. I phoned the police who arranged for a couple of units to go down to the vessel. I also contacted the harbour master, the modern slavery hotline and the fisherman's mission emergency number so that all relevant parties were notified of the situation. I then remained in constant communication with the police. After further police interviews, the men were placed in the care of Stella Maris. Against the odds, during the second lockdown, we found a hotel for the five men, loaded our mini bus with snacks and warm clothing. And in that hotel room at two o'clock in the morning, myself and two other chaplains offered pastoral support to the five highly distressed men, all strangers in England, still wearing their sea boots and who had been subjected to mental abuse, emotional abuse, abuse racial abuse, and even physical abuse. And of course, they had been subjected to dangerous and illegal working practices. One of the men was even denied medical treatment after suffering serious injury. These men were denied adequate food and drinking water, as well as having their identities and dignity stripped away from them. These men were forced to work for 20 hours a day and then expected to eat, sleep, shower, Contact, contact family and relax in the remaining four hours and were not even receiving wages into their bank accounts. The skipper and the first mate were constantly abusing the five men and forcing them to work harder and harder and always under pressure and intense stress. With no choice and without a voice, they worked the most treacherous of conditions on deck with no training, no safety harness, no safety equipment while constantly being shouted at and abused for not working fast enough and with no care for their safety or well-being. I'm not sure that the law or the police know about the thresholds or what the law calls a threshold, but I definitely believe without a shadow of a doubt they were victims of modern day slavery. Stella Maris helped to restore their confidence. We fed them bought them footwear and fresh clothing, gave them some cash. We arranged safe accommodation away from the public view. We provided spiritual support. We arranged legal representation, medical care, and even emergency dental surgery for two of the men. For 18 days, we provided comprehensive welfare and recreational care. The five men have all told me that they believe that without the intervention, support and care of Stella Maris, they most likely would be dead. The five men were eventually placed into the national referral mechanism and are still awaiting a decision from the Home Office on their future. Between Stella Maris and the Fisherman's Mission, we have also provided their five families back home with a total of £6,000 that was distributed by Stella Maris chaplains in Ghana and India and by an affiliate in Sri Lanka. Stella Maris is blessed to have dedicated, committed, faith-filled chaplains and volunteers, plus the most wonderful supporters up and down this country and across the world that do truly care about fishers, seafarers and their families. Thank you for listening. Wow. This, um, first, thank you so much, uh, uh, Deacon. Uh, this, um, I was just uh, captivated uh, by the story you've just uh, uh, told, which uh, goes to the core of the subject matter. It, it has all the trappings of what we've been discussing all evening. Uh, thank you so much for, for this uh, tremendous work uh, you do, and when I say you, I mean Stella Maris, 
thank you very much. It is recognized. I was just wondering, without the intervention of Stella Maris, who knows what would have happened to these five gentlemen? Uh, thank you so much, and I hope that it will be uh, resolved uh, in, in a way that will restore uh, the confidence of these and dignity of these men, which Stella Maris has already done a lot of work to get them back from the precipice as, as, as it were. Thank you very much. Uh, it is very much appreciated. And the questions are still rolling in. Now, as we come closer and closer uh, to the end of this very, very uh, engaging uh, discourse, uh, panel speakers are now gearing and ready to answer the questions. Uh, we have also been joined by Anne Donnelly, the regional port chaplain for Plymouth and Tegmouth, who shared her experiences of helping exploited fishermen in our recent Lent appeal. And of course, our very own uh, Martin Foley. Martin is Stella Maris GD's chief executive officer and the European Regional Coordinator. So we have a full house, very eminent individuals who are ready, willing to take your questions. So I'm going to start in no particular order. I will just uh, go and see which ones have been voted the most. Otherwise, I will start um, with any of the questions. And uh, who is the lucky uh, gentleman here? It's uh, James Gosling. Uh, and I'll read the question, and specifically to Mark. Uh, Mark said, obviously, your powers are limited by statute. However, if you come across conditions on board, that make you suspect exploitation. Can you tip off anyone? Would you choose someone like Stella Maris, for instance? Or is there anyone else apart from the police for more obvious criminal offenses? Would you like me to repeat the question, or is clear enough? Uh, you are muted. Still muted. Yeah, OK. Yeah, um, yeah, you're on now. OK, so by exploitation, I'm taking that to mean um, effectively what we would say was section one of, of the Modern Slavery um, Act in this country, which is forced compulsory labor there's quite a um, defined um, description of, of what modern slavery is and if we're saying uh, referring to it in terms of exploitation as a regulator and a governor we would really have to think about we have we're carrying a risk at that stage and that risk we would place with an agency that is a first responder agency and primarily we would look at probably the police um, who could take that risk uh, quickest? And obviously Nick's identified, and I have some experience of that one, uh, the Nick's uh, shown you. Um, of sometimes there's a, t there's a time imperative. Um, and for us, we wouldn't want to hold a risk of that nature. And so we would pass it on fairly rapidly to the police. I hope that helps. It does certainly help, and I'm sure uh, James uh, heard you loud and clear. Th thank you very much, uh, Mark. There's one more question for you, but I'll come back to that later on. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, I think this should go to Jess. Uh, I'm sure Jessica is, is, is waiting. Um, I'll read that out, uh, Jessica. In Cape Town, there were complaints regarding lack of number of fishers on board fishing vessels. For example, fishers on board CT7 fishing vessel 
requires 23 to 26 fishers. But there were two fishing vessels that had only 14 and 16 fishers respectively. Due to the lack of fishers on board, they are almost without rest. Now the question, is that considered as an indicator of modern slavery? Jessica. So that's a great question. And uh, to Mark's point about modern slavery being well-defined in the UK, it is not defined internationally. And for example, um, South Africa doesn't have any statutes around modern slavery. And uh, I, don't, I know that, I don't know what the flag state was as well, um, but it would absolutely um, be an indicator of forced labor and potentially up to modern slavery. Again, it depends on how you define it since it's not defined in an international convention like decent work and fishing is. But I think it also highlights an interesting point about the overlap between safety and um, exploitive working conditions that could be forced labor, modern slavery as well, and that operating the vessel with that few of fishers um, may present safety issues and certainly them not getting the rest um, needed to, to do the work safely. But we've seen lots of situations where fishers have worked um, few, you know, up to 22, 24 hours a day straight, several days in a row, and um, the extreme working hours is definitely an indicator of forced labor. Wonderful. Don't go away, Jessica. Um, the follow-up question, uh, and this one is from uh, Brownie Watson. He said, what signs can ship welfare visitors or port chaplains look out for to identify cases of modern slavery and exploitation? Do these signs differ from country to country? Jessica, I'll save you from this question. Uh, I'll, there's another question for you. So Deacon will be uh, more in tune with this. And I'll repeat that, uh, 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 Deacon Nick. What signs can ship welfare visitors or port chaplains look out for to identify cases of modern slavery and exploitation? Do these signs differ? from country to country. Hi, William, I, I, I can give an answer, but I just wondering if Anne Donnelly might like to answer just so people hear uh, a different voice. And Anne has uh, many years experience in dealing with modern slavery, so she might like to give an answer for this one. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Then you can supplement if, uh, if need be. Anne, please, fire yeah. on. Yes, hello, thank you, Nick, for inviting me um, to talk. I think um, one of the main things is, um, well, really, within the UK, we're very blessed having um, our chaplains, which will all get in touch with each other. Uh, so we have a good system there where we alert each other, as um, Nick is explaining, uh, um, got in touch with uh, Nick. Um, I think if you're on a port and you go down and you see a fishing vessel, one of the first things that stands out is that um, they are not visible. <laughs> You actually have to you have to make an effort to um, go and um, ask and see who's if it's a vessel that's you're not familiar or you, um, you 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 know that it can be associated with um, companies that um, exploit fishermen. It's good just to go and present yourself and say who you are, and then by watching and observing, you might see um, some of the fishermen who do look really um, well. They don't make eye contact at first. They stand sort of in the shadows um, and then when you do sort of um, get to, to see them uh, they look pretty um, unwell often pretty emaciated they've got their fishing gear on which obviously they've been wearing for a long long time and they want to talk to you and you know they want to talk to you and it's a case of just sort of hanging around and getting the opportunity to be able to do that I hope that helps mm. it does it does certainly um, help um, I have a follow-up question to you, Anne, uh, just to uh, give some clarification. This uh, question is from George Atkinson. Uh, he said, he's painted a picture. He said, we had 
uh, a case a few years ago where the officials were taken into police custody for their papers being out of date. And this was clearly the boat skipper's fault and not the NOT is in capital and not the officials' fault. Do you think this is fair? And will this happen now? Over to you. Sorry, who was that directed to, William? To you. Oh. Um, well, well, no, no, it isn't fair. And I think that that incident did happen a while ago. Um, I've just been involved in an incident in June, and actually the authorities are really all working closely together, or it was the first time that I've noticed that they have, where the MCA actually got in touch with Stella Maris to let them know that the vessel, um, that the fishermen needed help. And so it was handled very, very well that they, they the men felt protected. And as uh, Mark was saying, they had a safe place as well, where they could actually talk um, and uh, felt felt secure. Um, so I think things are, are, getting, are getting better, most definitely. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, this question will go to uh, Jessica and it's got a, four votes, so I consider that uh, quite popular. Now, this is from Magnus Johnson. Uh, Jessica, if you're if you listening, I'll read that out. He said, I just caught the end of Jesse's uh, presentation. Uh, we had IT issues, unfortunately, but heard you mention a continuum, something close to his heart, I mean, Magnus's heart. So what is the legal, minimum definition of slavery and what should it be? Apologies if this was covered in your talk. So the minimum, barest minimum definition of slavery. Jessica? I think Mark has highlighted um, the forced and compulsory, compulsory labor um, explanations in the UK's Modern Slavery Act. So that will be specific to the UK and specific to its definition of modern slavery. Globally, the slavery convention is uh, considered outdated. The international convention um, is considered outdated because it was in response to transatlantic slavery. So is not necessarily as responsive to sort of current manifestations. And um, so um, I'm going to give probably what Magnus would consider not a great answer. Um, but when we look at things like forced labor, which is articulated um, quite well in international conventions, so it can be applied across a broad context, not just a country like the UK, for example. Um, it, it's never considered just one indicator. Um, and even the International Labor Organization doesn't tell you how many of the 11, there are 11 indicators of forced labor, and not even the ILO specifies how many of those indicators should be present to constitute a case of forced labor. Um, so it's the culmination of the situation. And I think this is what makes it really tricky um, when some things are defined in law, clearly in some context, when some things are defined internationally, and when other things are, are not well defined, but all of these are are quite honestly still subjective measures and I or people's subjective interpretation like working hours it's very concrete you can say yes this person worked 24 hours straight mm -hmm. or this person worked 10 hours straight but for example I was interviewing a fisher a couple of weeks ago and uh, the fisher kept saying that the crew was playing a joke on him and that he was working up to 22 hours a day and when he would try to sleep for his two hours they would wake him up and bring him up on deck and then say no no go back to bed and he sort of laughed it off like it was a joke but it only happened to the filipino fishers on board the vessel and that starts sounding like quite honestly, psychological trauma to me. It felt a little like hazing. Um, that was my perception of it, which may have varied from that Fisher's perception. And when we talk about regulations like environmental regulations, illegal fishing, that's very black and white. You know, you, you are catching fish that you don't have a license for, or you're fishing in a space that you're not supposed to be. And it, it's just a, a fuzzier when we're talking about um, the conditions that people are subjected to, quite honestly. Wonderful. Comprehensively responded to 
Thanks very much, Jess. Uh, I, this question is going to go to uh, Martin Foley. I have two more from Reverend uh, Doug Duncan and uh, um, Anne McLaren. I'll come back to those two questions. And um, I crave your indulgence because this is a very important topic. I probably will overrun by about five minutes as we're coming uh, to the close of this uh, very important webinar. Uh, Martin, this question is to you and it's about Stella Maris. Uh, it's open ended. Would you tell this uh, wonderful audience what your next plans are in terms of this very critical subject matter? What is Stella Maris planning to do as we get into 2022? Martin? Yeah, thank you, William, and, and thank you to everyone for joining us for this evening's webinar. It's been fascinating listening to the presentations. Fundamental to the approach of Stella Maris is working in partnership, working in partnership with researchers like Jess, with statutory agencies like the MCA, and that will remain the bedrock of our approach. Our primary focus is on the practical pastoral support of the fishers and their families. Within the maritime context, the most acute welfare needs are seen in the fishing industry. And I know from conversations that I've had with my colleague, Father Bruno in Rome, and with my fellow regional coordinators, that we see our work with fishers as a key priority for Stella Maris, in that there is no other welfare agency that really has our reach into the fishers around the world. Yes, I think we can do more to advocate for fishers at that policy level. Um, the ILO Convention 188 has not been ratified by enough states, and it's certainly not adequately enforced by those states, uh, by some of those states rather, that have ratified it. So there is plenty for Stella Maris to do, but I emphasize that it's work in partnership with colleagues. And therefore, if there are people on this call that would like to work with Stella Maris, then please reach out to us and we will welcome the opportunity to work with you. But thank you very much, uh, Martin. Thank you so much uh, for the great work uh, you are doing uh, via Stella Maris. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, as I said, I will crave your indulgence to overrun by just a few minutes, just to take two more, uh, three more questions. And um, I will give this to uh, Dick and Nick. Uh, Dick, this is from Steve Murray. Uh, he said, in reference to Nick's uh, moving account, when is something going to change? This vessel slash owners have been doing this repeatedly for so many years, even involving fertilizers. So, when is anything going to happen? Over to you, Dickin. Yeah, thank you, William. No, it's a really good question. Um, I wish I had a very good answer. Um, but as, as, as they've said in the question, it's, it's been happening for a number of years that, that we know about. It possibly was happening before the first incident that, that sort of Stella Maris uh, and the Fisherman's Mission were working on. Uh, a number of years ago. There have been repeated infringements and issues with migrant fishermen with the same company. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that things are starting to move because I, I believe um, the early case, which dates back to about 2012, um, I think that that is starting to get ready to go to court in Scotland. So it, it looks like things, the wheels are starting to turn and things are starting to go forward. Uh, and I know that Mark, for example, uh, the MCA have been working really hard um, to, to sort of try and make sure that the infringements of health and safety uh, issues on the boat and the working conditions are improved and that they've detained boats for a number of weeks and even months, um, which obviously has a financial implication on the company. So, uh, so hopefully things are starting to move forward. And, and I think that people's awareness is starting now that people are a lot more aware. The issues are now more in the public eye. 
and I hope that you know this is something that we will be clamped down on and eventually stamped out um, as soon as possible. Thank you so much. I'm going to combine uh, two related questions, one from Rudderberg and uh, Anne McLaren, and both uh, would go to uh, Mark. Uh, Mark, I hope you're ready. Uh, I'll read that of uh, uh, Ruder first, and then add that of uh, McLaren, Anne McLaren. Uh, and it goes this way. Uh, what is the position of the UK Maritime and Coast Guard Agency where the boat has three skippers taking turns to take the boat out to the sea after the other, which then results to exploitation of the fishermen, uh, fishing crew, that is not enough rest. That's they keep rotating them. That's the principle. And possibility of violations of the ILO 188. That is on one side, not enough rest. And then for Mac, uh, Anne McLaren, the question is Do you think you should have more powers with regard to the Modern Slavery Act? And are you frustrated that you, as an agency does not have these powers. So you can decide how to answer a both combining both so that uh, in the interest of time. And I will only take uh, one more question from uh, Reverend uh, Don Duncan, and then we'll call it a day. Over to you, Mark. Can you hear me, William? Have I got the unmute done? L loud and clear. Oh, good. Okay, so the position. Uh, well, the position in terms of free skippers is, uh, we would look to the law. Uh, effectively, I think we've got to be a bit careful on terminology here. A vessel has one skipper, one master. It'll have officers of the watch, um, it'll have crew, but there should only be one skipper. And um, maybe the question is referring to uh, people who are keeping a watch, taking the vessel out. And that, that may be, uh, it is not unusual for vessels to only have two fully qualified uh, watch keepers, a skipper and officer of the watch. Uh, there might be a third one. So it is not unusual to have a shift pattern where the watch keeping is done by a limited number of people. Mm -hmm. um, hours of work, however, are governed by legislation and there is a statutory in instrument of 2004, uh, and if people are interested, that's number 1713 which lays down the hours of work for fishermen. And it's quite prescriptive. I won't go into all the different hours. It talks about the number of hours per week. Um, and it does give details of it. That being said, there is an amendment at the end which describes fishing as a hunting activity and unfortunately gives a certain amount of leeway to owners and operators of vessels to work outside those hours, but it must be done by an exception. And one of the issues clearly is it should be, these exceptions to the working hours should be recorded, but we are not always present, can't be always present when that happens. So it's, it's, it's somewhat difficult to monitor. Survey and inspection, when they get on board, do look at the hours of rest, whether they're the real hours of rest and work has actually happened, it, it, we're not always uh, able to say. But it is a regular, these things are regulated and we would really rely on complaints from the crew and evidence from the crew to be able to pursue anything in the, against an owner about that. Um, going on to powers at Modern Slavery Act, um, I think in terms of having first responders in this country, the UK has plenty of first responders in terms of every police force now will have had Modern Slavery Act training. I'd be very surprised if uh, most police officers aren't aware of the basic um, points to prove and uh, criteria for modern slavery. The National Crime Agency also, um, a lot, quite a lot of their resources put into modern slavery. They, uh, when I was there, had a, a unit in Birmingham that focused on modern slavery and human trafficking. And I think Border Force will also have trained their people in the identification and early uh, evidence gathering around modern slavery. So I'm not sure 
it is something that we need to have powers for because they are the, these there is a sufficient resource for us to be able to refer to um i i don't see that we need to have those powers i hope that helps william it does it does certainly help thank you the last uh, question to mark don't go away and i will round off uh you are the most popular kid on the block <laughs> this evening <laughs> as it were uh, okay uh it's from reverend doug duncan i said question to mark stella maris also has no authority and it also a voice in the wilderness but quite often picks up the pieces so what needs to be done and who needs to take ownership and make the required changes to ensure fishers are treated fairly and humanely in our modern society it's a beautiful question to round off the evening over to you mark well, I think uh, ILO 188 is probably, I mean, I, I'm, I'm post its implementation. Uh, it seems to me a very good convention. And uh, the legislation we have in this country has power to implement it. And um, it's certainly our survey and inspection teams are focused on it when they do inspections of vessels. So in terms of improving the welfare of fishers and seafarers, it's not just fishers, it's seafarers, that bit of legislation is, is I think, probably made maybe a quantum leap. It doesn't mean that there aren't people who op operate vessels criminally and seek to circumnavigate it. Um, and on those rare, on the, on the generally criminal elements in the uh, fishing vessel operators, I think we have to now increasingly look towards prosecution where we've looked towards trying to encourage compliance in the past. And maybe I think there's a increasingly, and bear in mind ILO 188 is still a relatively recent uh, addition to what we can implement. I, I think we, we probably need one or two prosecutions to actually make it clear that this um, uh, the statute of instruments which enforce ILO 188 have some teeth to them. But I think, yes, I think maybe the National Crime Agency maybe need to try and understand the level. What is the level of modern slavery? I think that they, they have the ownership for modern slavery, as I understand it, um, in terms of investigation in this country. And I think it's probably incumbent on them to perhaps through research, I don't know, with Jessica, to, to get a better understanding of of what the actual um the what is there i'm not sure perhaps uh, often i think the problem with fishing vessels the they're out of sight they're out of mind they're, they go out there the fishing vessels 50 miles offshore um that is you know, very easy to thing to ignore for a lot of people unfortunately yeah thank you very much mark and thank you to our very distinguished uh, uh panelists the speakers and more importantly to you, the fantastic uh, participants who have stayed on to this very time. There are five questions we didn't have time to answer. Uh, Barbara from Barbara, Malcolm and the rest. And of course, uh, we have uh, facilities to provide answers to these questions. But in total, all the questions we are answered somehow, you know, uh, along the line. So. Uh, we didn't miss uh, so much, but answers will be provided accordingly. Now, I, I'm rounding off. Um, this could have gone on for two, three hours because it's something that touches each and every one of us. We don't need to be at sea to know what these gentlemen and women uh, go through. Um, so uh, as you have heard tonight, uh, exploitation and modern slavery is a complex issue and one which takes support and action from many stakeholders to combat. Stella Maris is the only Christian maritime charity that supports fishers globally. This has been clearly demonstrated. We are there in the good times and of course in the bad times. And because of our constant presence, we provide fishers with a safe and trusted friend in time of need. 
We feel very fortunate to be able to support fishers in times of crisis, but we couldn't do it without our supporters. That is you. So thank you. If you would like to help exploited fishermen, there are details of how you can donate to Stella Maris in the chat. There are also many of you here tonight from other NGOs and government agencies around the world. If you would like to speak with us about how we can work together to advocate and bring change for fishers around the world, please contact us. You can see the details on the screen. Our own Martin Foley's contact details have just been added to the chat as well. Distinguished participants, panelists, all of you present, it is now time and remains for me to say a very big thank you to all of you and wish you all a very good night's rest. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here.